You guys doing well? Everything is running fine? What are you guys doing now? Proposal, project proposal. Internal. It's more intense now. Yeah. Okay, so the plan for today is to continue what we started last week on the structural utilization, right? So last week we, we started uh, doing this analysis, so if you have a, a, a panel or a plate like this, just a, a very quick summary of what we did last week. So imagine you have a, a plate like this with these dimensions. Okay, this do it, this width B and this thickness T. And assuming that you have in this plate a, a, a stress due to bending, so sigma one, sigma two, and then we have a, a very generic distribution of these stresses, right? Something like this, okay? We, ha we have seen that we could create a, um, a simplified model with some assumptions. First, we assume we are assuming that this thickness is equal to zero. So let's say this is the real real structure, this is the idealizer, okay? So this is a concept, a concept or is a model, right? So that's why we can assume thickness equal to zero in this model. And we also said that, okay, we will build this, what we call booms, these two booms here. Right, boom one, B one, B two, and these direct stresses that you have here on the left hand side, it will be carried by these two booms. So you will have here, you will have here, sigma one, the stress at boom one, and the stress at boom two. And our main objective last week was to basically calculate the area of these booms, right? And we concluded from the same moment, from the, from the same moment, um, so about point 0.2, remember? We did calculate the moments about point 0.2 for the real structure and for the idealized structure. And we concluded that the area of boom 1 is given by this equation here. And the area of boom number two is given by this equation here. So I think this is this was the, the point where we, we finished last week. And I, I would like to start basically from, from this point. Uh, for example, imagine I give you something like this, a, 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 cross, a rectangular cross-section like this one. Uh, let's say... For example, I, this thickness is three millimeters, this one is two millimeters, this thickness here is one millimeter. And this thickness here is also one millimeter, okay? So I give you this, uh, for example, I also tell you that this dimension from the, the midpoint 
for example, imagine this is 100 millimeters, and this one is 80, for example. Okay? All right? And I ask you to build the idealized model from this real one. So this is a cross section, a cross section. Okay? So we have to use this, these two expressions here to get the area of the booms. Uh, so the first thing you need to, to, to do is to get the, the neutral axis. So this is quite easy, right? This is a symmetric cross section. The neutral axis should be the, the, the midpoint. So, so let's say we, we are going to arrange so we need to consider these four points. We are going to have four booms in our idealized model. So let's say this is point number one, two, three, four, something like this. OK? If we start the analysis from uh, point for the boom number one, this one here, OK? For this boom here, we are going to build. So we can see that this boom is sharing this section, one, two, right? And together with this section, I'm going to represent now in green, one, four. You agree with me or not? This point one basically has a plate, one, two, and it also has a vertical plate, three, four, OK? So we need uh, we need to say that the area of boom number one, so or B one, uh, is going to be given by by this expression here, right? Or B T over six two times. So if I look at this plate, plate one, two at the top, I will need to have the ratio sigma two over sigma one. You agree with me? So this is the contribution from this plate here on the top, this one. I need to have the stress at point two over the stress at point one. And B is the, the width, T is the thickness of this plate one, two. But because point one is also sharing with plate one four, I need to add here the contribution of plate one four, which is going to be also a width. So this B is going to be different. So let me call this a different name, maybe A, T. So I can call this T one two. I can call this T one four over six, two plus, now I need to have the ratio between the stress at point four, sigma four, and stress at point one, sigma one. Why? Because in this equation, what you have in the denominator is always the stress at the same point where you are calculating the area of the boom, right? And the stress in the numerator is the other point of, of the plate. So if it is plate one, two, that stress should be sigma two. If it is plate one, four, that should be sigma 4, OK? Uh, so if I replace this, this value, so the width of plate 1, 2, this B, is 100. The thickness is 1 millimeter over 6, 2 plus. Now, this sigma 2 over sigma 1, we, we have seen last week. Both these stresses come from bending. So I can write here sigma 2 over sigma 1 is going to be equal to the bending moment for the cross section times the distance of point two to the neutral axis over the second moment of area, while sigma one is also coming from bending. So bending moment times the distance of point one of neutral axis over the second moment of area, right? So this, so second moment of area cancels, the moment cancels, so this becomes y2 over y1 or in this particular example, y2 and y1, they are the same, equal to 40, right? So this ratio is going to be equal to 1. OK, you see? 
However, if you try to calculate now the ratio of sigma 4 over sigma 1, you need to have this, y4 over y1. And that this ratio y4 over y1 is now equal to minus 1. Because y4 is on the negative. So this is my positive y direction, right? So y4 is, uh, on, uh, is below the neutral axis. So the, the distance to the neutral axis is going to be a negative distance. Sir? Th that's why you get minus 1. Yes. Are you taking the origin to be the same to the center, right? Sorry? The, or, the origin, the coordinate. The, the uh, origin in neutral axis. Okay. Yeah. That's what you do in bending, right? You always, this, this vertical axis in bending, the origin is always at neutral axis, right? So the contribution from plate 1, 2 is going to be 2 plus 1. The ratio sigma 2 over sigma 1 is equal to 1. And the contribution from plate 1, 4, so this A now is 80. The thickness is 3, so 80 times 3 over 6. 2, and now sigma 4 over sigma 1 is minus 1, so 2 minus 1. Okay? So if you do all these calculations, you get the area. So here you have... Uh, 300 over 6. 300 over 6 is, how much is that? 50, right? You have 50 here, and then here you have 240 over 6. It's 40, right? So 50 plus 40 makes 90 millimeters square. is the area of boom number one. Okay? So we can... I can start building my idealized model. It's going to be something like this. Right? So my idealized model is going to be... I will have a boom here another boom here so this B1 so the area of this boom we know already it is equal to 90 millimeters square so boom 1 we can do like this right boom number 2 So if we do boom number two, we get again BT over six. So B is the width is 100. The thickness is again one over six. So two plus sigma one over sigma two. Again, that ratio is equal to one. So that is the contribution from plate one, two. Now we need also to add the contribution plate two, three, right? So plus, plus, um, the width is 80, the thickness now is 2, over 6, 2. Now we, I need to have sigma 3 over sigma 2, so I need to have this. But sigma 3 over sigma 2 is equal to y3 over y2. Y3 is minus 40, Y2 is 40, so that this ratio is equal to minus 1 again. So I can replace this with minus 1. And then I will have what? I will have again 50. This is 50. And this term here is going to be 160 over 6. 160 over 6 is, how much is that? Can you please do that? 160 over 6. 26.6. So the total is going to be 76.6 square 
millimeters so we can say that our boom number two b2 the area is going to be 76.6 square millimeters all right and the good thing is that boom number three and boom number four we can get the areas from symmetry right and for example if you look from point three is sharing three four the plate 3 4 with the plate 3 2, three two right so it's going to be symmetric in, in what regards the area of boom number 2 so we can say the area of boom number 3 is going to be 76.6 and the area of boom number 4 90 millimeters square okay all right so this model is going is a simplified model so these booms that you have there they only carry direct stresses while these skins that you have here they will carry these shear flows okay so we clearly separated here uh, these different structural elements the, the the kind of stresses they are carrying the booms they carry the bending stresses from bending and the skins, in this idealized model, they will carry the shear flows. Uh, we are going to see today that uh, these shear flows in these skins, they are going to be constant. For example, this shear flow we can call shear flow Q0. Between point one and two, between this boom and this boom, this shear flow Q0 in this skin is going to be constant. That is very different of what we did two weeks ago for the transverse shear of this real structure, right? We had a linear distribution or quadratic, remember? Yes? How do you tell which way I was going to do? Yeah, we, we are going to talk about this uh, uh, now. Uh, that's the next thing we are going to derive today. Uh, I'm just uh, representing here just to give you, basically I'm trying to give you the differences between the real cross-section and the idealizer, okay? Um, so you, you, you remember in these real cross sections we had the kind of this distribution of the shear flows remember we did examples like this right a linear for example here we had quadratic remember in these walls yeah I'm going back to you in these walls here right in the case of idealizing structures the shear flow Q0 in this between this point and this point between these two booms one and two the shear flow Q0 is constant this one, shear flow Q1 between boom number one and boom number four in this wall is constant as well. That is another simplification that we, we will get. I, I'm going to show you why this is going to happen, okay? Yeah? And how come there's no term that accounts for material properties? Material properties? Yeah, I mean, there's no term, you know, there's no constant or anything like that. It's like, you know, would we'll, we'll this little we'll bit cross sectional area be different if it's you know, steel or if it's aluminium? Well, we are going to use, you remember the, the gradient of twist, the twist angle, mm -hmm. torsion, right? Yeah. You have material property there. Okay, so the model, the model of rigidity oh, okay. is there, right? So that is one thing. So if you want to get the rotation, also if you want to get the deflection of the wing, for example, you need to have material properties. Yeah. But for this case, we are just getting now the shear flows and the bending stresses. So the only thing you need for that is you need the bending moment, right? And transverse shear force. You need the cross-section inertia, like the second moments of area, products of inertia, right? That's all you need for getting the stresses. The material is important if you want to get the, the, the twist angle, if you want to get the deflection of the wing, you need to have material properties. Because you're right, it's not the same thing having steel or having uh, composite material, for example, right? Or aluminium. Uh, but that is more important for well, not only for that, right? Imagine you, you have a, in, in, in the boom, you have a direct stress, which is, let's say, 500 megapascal. You, if you want to use an aluminum, where, where the yield stress is only 300 megapascal, then you, are, you have a problem, right? So it's also important for, for, for that, okay? All right, so what I would like now to, to start discussing with you is uh, uh, how can we now obtain these shear flows? So we will have here, for example, Q3. Thank you for how can we have this shear flow in the idealized, idealized cross section? And for that, I need to, uh, I need to. So I need to get this picture here. So I'm going to copy this 
configure to here and make it bigger. Maybe something like this, okay? Now, this figure, so what you see there is basically two skins. Uh, you, you see this skin here, R minus one, okay? And you see another skin here that I said is skin R, skin R and skin R minus one. And then you have three booms. You have this boom here, you have this boom here at the middle, and you have this boom BR plus one at this end, okay? So this is the, so keep this figure in mind. So what we want to see is what happens to the shear flow. So you can see that in this skin, in this first skin here, you have this shear flow QR minus one. And you can see this shear flow is constant, like I said, right? In this wall, this shear flow is constant. But what happens is when this shear flow crosses the, this boom here at the middle, you see this boom here? When this shear flow QR minus one crosses this boom, the shear flow is going to change. So the shear flow in this skin here, QR, is going to change from this value to this value here at the top, okay? So whenever we cross a boom, it's going to be a change in the shear flow. So, and that change is given by this, this jump that you have here on the shear flow, you see? Uh, of course, the shear flow in this wall R, in this skin R, is still constant, but when you compare the shear flow in skin R with the shear flow at skin R minus one, these two shear flows, they are different. There is a jump because we cross the boom, okay? This is valid for transverse shear analysis. And transverse shear is very important in aircraft because we have the lift is a transverse shear force, right? So that's why we need to, to analyze these shear flows uh, very well, okay? So what we are going to do now is our goal is to see what is this jump or this change on the shear flow when we cross a boom. That is our main goal. And for that, I'm going to need, uh, maybe I can get this figure as well. Copy. Okay, so this, this second figure here below, what you have is, basically I'm, I'm, I'm making the free body diagram of the boom at the middle. This boom here at the middle, this one, this is the boom here, okay? And on the left side, I have uh, the skin R with this shear flow QR, QR, okay? So don't forget this is a shear. This is a shear, right? So you, you remember from plane stress analysis, when you have a shear, you need to have in, in these other sides of this wall, you need to have also the shear stresses or in, the case, in this case, shear flow flowing this way, right? So they respect the equilibrium equations, right? So for example, this shear flow is in balance with this shear flow on this wall. If you do summation of forces in the vertical direction, they are in equilibrium, right? Same thing for this. The shear flow in this wall is in equilibrium with the shear flow in this wall, right? Summation of forces in the y direction equal to zero. And if you do the summation of moments about the center of this skin, that summation of moments is going to be equal to zero as well in equilibrium. So these are the equilibrium equations you learned in year one. Another thing you learned in year one is the action reaction or Newton third law, right? So if you have a shear flow in this wall, which is basically the action of the boom into the, the, the wall, the skin, right? What is going to happen is the skin is going to react onto the boom with a shear flow, the same magnitude, but in the opposite direction, right? Action reaction. Remember this from year one? You did, you did year one with me or not? Yes. Yeah, I think I, I, I'm quite sure I spoke about this. So action-reaction, right? 
So that's what's happening here. So this, this force, this is a shear flow that you have on the boom, which is basically the action of the skin on the left side, uh, the action of that skin on, on the boom, right? Same thing for this one here. This shear flow that you have on the boom on this side is the action of this skin into the boom, right? Okay? Now, what else do, do you have at, at the boom? Well, you have, when you are at this point on, on the wing, this point here, you have a, 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 a stress from bending, which is sigma z. But when you move, so imagine this like a beam, okay? Imagine a beam like this, with a transverse shear force. If you consider two sections here, right? You know that the bending moment, you remember that in year one as well, we did the, the bending moment diagram. Right? We did some, something like this, let's say, imagine you get a, a distribution of the, the bending moment. Remember this from your one? So if you consider these two sections of the beam, if you consider these two sections, right? At this section, you have a bending moment which is different from the bending moment from that, this section here, right? You can see it here, right? Yeah. Two different values, right? So this means what? Don't forget this direct stress come from this equation from bending. So if the bending moment is different, is changing from this point to this point, we have different values for the bending moment, right? It means the bending moment is changing. That will mean your stress will be changing as well. So that's what happens when you move from this point to this point. Your stress will change from sigma z at this section to sigma z plus something more that I called delta sigma z, okay? So in this cross section here of the boom. So it's going, basically it's going to be a variation on, on the, the bending stress. And this variation of the bending stress, we can get it, so we, we can get, we can say something like this. This sigma z at, um, A time step, not time step. Um, sigma z at location uh, z plus delta z, delta z, this one here, okay, is going to be equal to the previous sigma z at location. Uh, z um, plus the derivative of sigma z in order to z times delta z plus higher order terms that we are going to ignore. So this is the Taylor series, right? This is the Taylor series uh, expansion. So the sigma z for uh, this section here is going to be equal to the previous sigma z at the other section plus the derivative of sigma z in order to z times delta z. So this, if you send sigma z to the left hand side, you will get something like this. Okay? And this that you have here is our C delta sigma z, okay? Which is going to be equal to the derivative of sigma z in order to z. Oops. Okay, so this is the final result I want. Uh, this is to explain this guy here, okay? Delta sigma z, how much is this delta sigma z we are going to use? delta sigma z given by this expression here, okay? Basically the equal to the derivative of the bending stress times uh, that increment along the longitudinal direction of, uh, of the wing, for example, right? If this is a cross-section of a wing. Okay? Uh, and then what we are going to do now is, is quite easy now so basically we have this we have this free body diagram which is this boom 
we are going to look at this free body diagram here and do the use the equilibrium equation for the forces okay we are going to say something like this If you do summation of forces in the z direction equal to zero, is the equilibrium equation. What you get is, well, you get sigma z plus delta sigma z So this is a stress. I need to multiply by an area to get the force. Which area is that? Is the area of the boom, right? So we can say this is the area of the boom, which is boom R. This boom, you, you can see here, this guy, right? BR. So I need to multiply this by BR. So now I get the force. This is a force. I need to subtract with this sigma z, so minus sigma z times BR again as well. Right, and um, yeah, what else do I have? Well, I have the shear flow, so I have this shear flow QR here, so plus QR, uh, so this is a force per unit length, so I need to multiply this by this delta Z length. And I have this other shear flow here, which is going to be minus let me shrink this a little bit. Okay. Minus Q, Q R minus one times again delta Z. And this should be equal to zero to be in equilibrium. Right? So if I replace this delta sigma z by this delta sigma z we obtained here, we get, and we can also do something more because these guys, they, they cancel. Look, this one cancels with this. Yeah. Now if I replace, I get what? I get the derivative of sigma z in order to z times br times delta z plus QR delta Z minus QR minus one delta Z equal to zero. Another good news is that this delta Z cancels. So we are getting a much simple expression. Uh, we are getting a much simple expression that will give us what it will give us something like this uh, so i'm going to keep this qr and qr minus one on the left hand side so we will get qr minus qr minus one is going to be equal and then i'm going to send this guy to the right hand side so i need to change the signal so minus the derivative of sigma z in order to z times the area of the boom this expression here is very 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 important why because what what we have on the left hand side qr minus qr minus one this is what if you look at this initial figure here qr minus qr minus one is this jump on the shear flow when we cross the boom that's what we are looking for isn't it do you remember this? We, we started this analysis as saying, okay, I have in this wall, I have, I have the shear flow QR minus one, this one in red, constant. And, but when I cross the boom, my shear flow is going to change to QR, this one in green. And QR minus QR minus one is going to be this difference, right? It's going to be this difference here, this jump is going to be equal to QR minus QR minus one. And this jump, QR minus QR minus one, we can, if you want, we can call it a variation on the shear flow, delta Q, whenever we cross the boom. 
is going to be given by what? The area of the boom, BR, times the derivative of the direct stresses that come from bending. Direct stresses that come from bending. Okay? Uh, so this is quite important. So I'm just going to copy this and put in a different... page so let me put this one here and now I'm going to copy this as well this equation here which is the general unsymmetric bending equation copy paste right we can maybe make it make it a bit bigger like this. Look, the variation on shear flow when you cross the boom is equal to minus the derivative of the direct stress as time the area of the boom. The direct stress equation is this one, okay? That comes from bending. So I just need to do the derivative. If I do, if I try to do, I'm going to do here the derivative of sigma z in order to z. The only thing I need to do is um, look the the second moments of area i x i y and the product of inertia they are for the entire cross section so they don't uh, they don't uh, in that cross section they don't change they are constant right so the derivative of this second moments of area and products of inertia is zero, is equal to zero, because they are constant on cross-section. The only thing that I really need to make the derivative is, I need to do the derivative of this bending moment in order to z. I need to do the derivative of this bending moment in order to z. And same thing for this guy. And same thing for this guy here, right? Okay? You all agree with me or not? Hmm? You also know that we did this in year one. The derivative of the bending moment is equal to the transverse shear force in this case, Sx, and the derivative of this bending moment, mx in order to z, is equal to the transverse shear force, Sy, in this case. All right? So if I replace this in this equation, I get something like this. So if I use this equation here, and if I replace here sigma z, or the derivative of sigma z, by this derivative here, okay? You get something like this. The shear flow QR is going to be equal to the shear flow QR minus one. I can send QR minus one to the right hand side, it's fine. Minus, minus what? Now I'm going to replace the derivative. So I will have uh, SX Ixx minus Sy Ixy over Ixx Iyy minus Ixy square. This will multiply by Br. This the area of the boom comes from there, right? Times x minus minus. Now I have the second term here, okay, I need to include, which is Sy, Iyy, minus Sx, Ixy, which is a product of inertia, Ixx, Iyy, minus Ixy squared. This will multiply the area of the boom, again, times the y coordinate. And this is the final equation we are going to use we are going to use this for the solution of some examples today now, all right? This equation tells me what? Again, the variation 
variation of the shear flow when I cross a boom. So what, what do I need to know? Well, I need to know the, the uh, in, inertia uh, properties of the cross-section, second moments of area, and product of inertia. I need to know, well, and that is given, the transverse shear forces. So in this case, we have transverse shear force in the x direction. It can be, for example, the drag on a wing. And the transverse shear force in the y direction can be the lift on the wing, right? So that is also given to us normally, that we, we know that. The area, we need to know the area of the booms, but we calculated the area of the booms before, right? In this example here, I show you how to, you can get the area of the booms, of the different booms from a, a real structure when we built our idealized model. And then this x, this x and y are basically the distance uh, of the boom to the neutral axis. For example, let me just undo this because if you look at this example we did here, all right? Um, if you put, so this is neutral axis. If you put your coordinate system here, so this is your y direction, this is your x direction. Sorry. This is your y direction. This is your x direction. For example, if you are analyzing this boom here, B2, this is going to be your y coordinate, distance to neutral axis. This is going to be your x coordinate, right? See? Are always the, the distance to neutral axis. This x and y. So with this equation here, we can now easily, as you're going to see, this is going to be very easy when compared with what we did two weeks ago for the real structure, the real cross-section, right? This is going to be so easy to get the shear flows when we cross the booms. So what we are going to do is, we are going to define some booms in the cross-section. We are going to start crossing the booms and getting the variation on the shear flows whenever we cross a boom, right? And we are going to solve the problem very, very quickly. Yes? So I'm so confused why there's a minus on the top line. Yeah, I, I, I have this, I always do this way, but I, I already understand that you guys don't like this guy here, right? <laughs> yeah, it's not minus times minus becomes a plus. No, 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 no. It's a minus, okay? All right. So I suggest before we start doing now some examples to see how this works, you, are going, you guys are going to see this is very, very simple, very quick and simple. Let's do a, a quick break, okay? All right? Very good. So before we start doing the examples, a couple of examples. There is one. So this is the final equation, uh, which I'm going to copy. We're going to use this. But there is just one thing I would like to refer on this equation, which is for example, imagine. So this equation is for a situation like this. Oops. Where you have okay, so you have this shear flow Q R minus one. Then it crosses this boom B with area B R in the middle. And then what you get here on this side is the shear flow Q R. Okay? But for example, you can have a cross section which is a bit more complicated than this. This is well, this is not a cross section, these are two skins. But you can have, for example, imagine you have a, a cross section like this. Uh, and idealize a cross section with two cells. So you have a boom here, a boom here, boom here, something like this. Imagine you have a cross section like this. Okay? So you might, so how do you define these, these shear flows, the orientations? So what you have to do is you have to uh, assign an initial orientation to the shear flow. So let's say, for example, you start here, this skin in the bottom, you define this shear flow like Q0, then it will cross this boom. Part of the shear flow is going this way, let's say shear flow Q1, and part of the shear flow is going then up on this wall, Q2, 
okay? Then this Q1 will cross this boom, and after crossing the boom, we will have here a new shear flow, let's say Q3. And then this Q3 is going to cross this boom, so we are going to have here Q4. Look, Q4 is going to enter this boom here, at the middle, top middle boom, and it's going to merge with this shear flow Q2, and then they merge together, and then they continue flowing here with a different shear flow that I will call Q5, you see? Then this Q5 will cross this boom here at the top and will flow down with a shear flow Q6. So this is my initial orientation, I assume. So why did I assume this orientation? Well, I'm thinking like water flowing. If you imagine water flowing, if, if you put some water here, Q0, one, once he finds this junction here, this boom, part of this water goes to Q1 and part will go up with Q2. So we measure the water flowing. So we give this initial orientation. Is this initial orientation correct or not? So we don't know at the beginning, but we're going to use this equation here to calculate the, we're going to use this equation to calculate the, the shear flows when we cross the booms. And the signal of the shear flow will tell me if my orientation is correct or not. If you get a negative shear flow, it means your initial orientation was wrong. You go back, like we, we did in static, remember? When you, you put the reactions, you give an initial orientation. You do the equilibrium equations at the end. If the signal is negative, it means you need to go back and reverse the direction of the reaction. Here is the same thing. But what I want to tell you is, uh, uh, now is, um, if you look, for example, at this boom here, if you look at this boom here, I'm going to make it red on the top. If you put it here, okay? What you're going to have in this boom is, well, this boom has three skins attached, these two horizontal skins and this vertical skin, right? And you have here Q4, you have here Q5, and you have here Q2, right? Okay? So, we still use this same equation, but the problem here is we have basically three shear flows, while here in this equation we have only two shear flows, QR and QR minus one. So, how do we solve this equation for this particular example? Well, you need to do something like this. This part is still the same, but the shear flows entering the boom, they will be located on, uh, no, basically we can, we can do this. So I add something like this, right? QR minus QR minus one, right? So the shear flows entering the boom, they will have a negative. So on the left, on, on the left hand side, they will, they will have a negative, a negative signal. And the shear flows leaving the boom, they will have a positive signal. So in this case of this example, what I need to have here on the left hand side is something like this. Q5 is leaving the boom, so it's going to be positive. So I need to have here Q5. Q2 and Q4, they are entering the boom, right? So I need to put them with a negative signal. So I will have minus Q2, minus Q4. Okay? So that's it. So if you have a boom where with 10 skins attached, the rule is always this. On the left hand side, the shear flows entering the boom will have a negative signal. The shear flows leaving the boom will be positive, okay? On the left hand side of this equation. And then everything else is the same. And now I think we are in good conditions to start doing some examples. So I want to start with a very simple example, uh, open cross-section. Uh, so any questions here? Can we move to some examples? Yeah, so let's start with this very simple example now, open cross-section, C-shape cross-section. You have four booms, okay? This is the neutral axis. 
So you have this uh, shear force applied at the shear center. 48 kilonewtons. Dimensions for this. So from here to here is Two thousand millimeters. Same thing from here to here. Two thousand millimeters. Okay. Uh, and then you have also this dimension from here to here. Also two thousand millimeters. Okay. So this is boom number one. Boom number two boom number three and boom number four okay so this also um, this is your x-axis this is your y-axis Right? They also say that each boom, so boom one, the area of boom one is equal to the area of boom two, equal to the area of boom three, equal to the area of boom four, equal to 300 square millimeters. Okay? Alright, so this is the question. The, uh, the question is calculate the shear flows. Calculate the shear flow distribution in the channel section, which, load is, lo which is loaded through the shear center as shown in. The section is idealized and each boom has a cross sectional area of 300 square millimeters. Okay? Yeah, they want to know the distribution of the shear flow, so we can assign an initial distribution, let's say, let's call this Q0. Q1, Q2, is it okay? You can give any name you want. So I, I'm assuming an anti-clockwise distribution for the shear flows. Right? So we have to, I'm going to copy maybe this equation. Copy. Make it very small here, All right? Uh, and oops, and I also maybe write this in very in a very general way, right? Uh, I can say QR okay this is extremely small maybe. right uh, yeah now, before we start using this equation, we can simplify this a lot, this equation a lot. Why? Because all booms have the same area, right? 300 square millimeters. So this is going to be a symmetric. There is a, a, a symmetry plane XZ, right? Or uh, there is a symmetry axis, if you want. The X axis divides this cross section into two equal parts, right? So because of that, we know that the product of inertia is equal to zero. Whenever you have a, an axis that divides the cross section into equal parts, the product of inertia is equal to zero. So that simplifies a lot. For example, this term disappears, this term disappears as well, together with this, right? See? 
another thing that we also don't have, so we have only a transverse shear force in the vertical direction equal to 48 kilonewtons. The transverse shear force in the x direction is equal to zero. So everything that has Sx will also disappear, right? Is it? So we can simplify this expression for this example by saying that we will have QR equal to QR minus 1 minus we have here S Y I Y Y over I X X I Y Y so this in fact this Y Y also cancels times the area of the boom times the distance to the neutral axis so this is the simplified equation which is much much simpler than the other one in the top so this the result of this equation is because of this uh, particular situation of this example symmetry and only a transverse shear force in the vertical direction that's it because of that this equation became much more simplified now there is one thing that you can see here that appears, which is the second moment of area about this x-axis, passing on the neutral, uh, uh, which is the neutral axis, right? So we need to calculate this for the idealized cross-section, which is extremely easy because only we are only taking into consideration the booms, right? For the second moment of area. Don't forget, we are saying that the, these walls, these skins, this skin, this skin, and this skin, in the idealized model, we are saying that they have a thickness equal to zero, right? So they don't have any contribution for the second moment of area. So I can say that the second moment of area is going to be given by the summation from i equal to one to four, because we have four booms, four booms, okay? Summation of what? The area of the boom, sorry, bi, times the square of the distance of each boom to the neutral axis. This is, this comes from the parallel axis theorem that I think we discussed it in year one, or you did in year two? You did in year two, right? Remember the parallel axis theorem? Do you remember? When, for example, for this rectangular shape, a very quick one, with this height h, this width b, this is x bar axis passing on the neutral axis, right? Uh, we we have said, for example, if I want, uh, so you you know this second moment of area about this is b h power three over twelve about this axis passing on the neutral axis of the, uh, on the centroid of the cross-section. But for example, if I want to calculate the second moment of area about this axis passing on, passing on the, this parallel axis, x, I, I, the, ter, the parallel axis theorem says it's equal to i x bar x bar. Well, this is equal to b h power 3 over 12, right? plus uh, the area of the cross-section, so let's say this is A, times the distance between these two axes, right? The distance square, okay? So what happens in our case is in the case of the boom, what we have is we will have, imagine this is, you have a boom here, okay, with this area bi. This is the distance of the boom to the neutral axis, okay. So if you compare, so this is my x bar axis, 
passing on the boom. This y is going to be equal to this d, right? This d and this y is going to be the distance between these two parallel axes, right? So the reason why I said that the second moment of air is calculated by the area of the boom times the square of the distance to the neutral axis comes from this term here, that we have here. So this A is the area of the boom. This distance between these two axes is the distance of the boom to the neutral axis square, right? So we are assuming for the boom it is a point, so this term here is equal to zero for the second moment of area. So this comes from, comes from here, okay? So anyway, the important thing for you is that for the calculation of the second moment of area, I just need to do this summation, which is quite easy. Look, all booms have um, um, area of 300. So the area of boom is 300. The distance, the square of the distance, so for example, boom one has distance 2,000, boom two has distance 2,000, boom three minus 2,000, boom four minus 2,000. But because of the square, it doesn't matter if it is plus or minus, at the end, we always get a positive number, right? So I can say something like this. I will multiply this by 2,000 square. And because I have four booms, I can multiply this by four in this particular example. So that's it. Very simple to get the second moment of area of, uh, of uh, uh, this cross-section, this idealized cross-section, right? So if you do that, the, you get the result. I have that result here of 4, 8, 0, 0 times 10 power 6 millimeters power 4. OK? This is the second moment of area you obtain from this calculation, right? OK? Good. Now, um, so I can also delete this one in its space, so I can delete this as well. I can move this here, shrink maybe a little bit. Okay? And we can delete this to find some space. Now we can. So what are we going to do now? We are going to start crossing the booms. So we are starting with boom number one. I'm going to cross boom number one. So boom number one is located at the free edge. So the shear flow before, I can do something like this, the shear flow before here, this shear flow is equal to zero, right? There's nothing in a free edge before I cross the boom. There is no shear flow. So I can say that Uh, the shear flow, so following this equation, I can say that the shear flow after crossing the boom, which is Q0, after crossing boom 1, so you can, you can say uh, crossing boom 1. We are going to cross boom 1 and we are going to see what happens to the shear flow, okay? So after crossing the boom, I have Q0 needs to be equal, according to this equation, to the shear flow before crossing the boom, which is zero, because boom one is at the free edge, so we can put here zero, minus, now, transverse shear force, 48 kilonewtons, we can convert to newtons, 48 times 10 power three. Second moment of area of the idealized cross-section, we calculated is four eight, uh, times 10 power 8. You agree with me? I can do this, right? You can see why I'm doing this for convenience. Now, what's next? I need to multiply by the area of the boom that is being crossed. The boom that is being crossed is boom 1. The area is 300, 300 square meters. Uh, sorry, square millimeters. Next thing is the distance of boom one to the neutral axis. And that distance is this distance from this point to 
two neutral axes, which is equal to 2000. You all agree? Positive, right? Now, the signal is important here because it's the distance. It is not the distance square. Okay? So, times 2000. So, if you do these calculations, you get the shear flow is going to be negative. Q0 is going to be negative. So, you can see that the orientation that we initially assumed is wrong. Sir, yeah? do we not need to convert the fluid variation to the meters squared? Uh, no, if you, well, if you work with millimeters, so here you are working with forces Newton, right? For the second moment of area, you are working with millimeters power four, right? Uh, so it means you need also to use the the boom area millimeters square. What you cannot do is, for example, boom areas in millimeters square and the second moment of area in meters power four, right? That you cannot do. Everything in meters or everything in millimeters? It doesn't matter. Okay? All right? Uh, what else? Yeah, so if you do these calculations, you get um, minus six Newton. Now, look at the units. Newton per millimeter now, okay? We are working force in Newtons, and the, the, these lengths and areas, and second moments of area are using millimeters, right? Okay, so we cross boom one, we get this. Uh, next thing we have to do is, I'm going to copy. In fact, I can copy all of this. Next thing we need to do is we need now to cross boom number two. We are going to continue our analysis, but now we are going to cross this boom here, number two. All right? So if I cross boom number two, I will still use the same equation to cross the boom number two. I will get what is the shear flow after crossing the boom is Q1, right? Q1 equal to the shear flow before crossing the boom, which is Q0. Minus, again, same thing, 48 times 10 power 3, 48 times 10 power 8. The area of the boom being crossed is also 300. Distance to the neutral axis is also 2,000. Okay? But we know that Q0 is equal to minus 6 newtons per millimeter. So I can replace in Q0, I can replace, and I can say Q1 is going to be equal to minus 6. And this term here is also equal to minus 6. So this is going to be minus 6, minus 6. So this is going to be minus 12 Newton per millimeter. OK? So this is the shear flowing on the vertical wall. And last one we have to do is Q2 which is going to be equal to minus 6 as well from symmetry. We can immediately see that. But we can, we can calculate just to confirm, just to confirm that it is the case. So we can do that very quickly. So I'm going to cross now boom number 3, this one here at the bottom, boom number 3. So if I cross boom number three, I get what is the shear flow after crossing the boom is Q2. Shear flow before crossing the boom is Q1 minus, this is the same. The area of the boom is also 300. Now, very important, the distance, so you tend to have mistakes here. The distance of boom 3 to the neutral axis is now minus 2,000. Okay? Minus 2,000. 
So Q1, we, we know that it is minus 12 from the previous boom that we crossed. So we have here minus 12. Now look, this minus with this minus become, this term becomes positive. So this becomes now plus six. So this becomes minus six Newton per millimeter at the end, right? Okay. Now the good thing, now comes the interesting thing. Let's replace the shear flows and let's do some checks to see if we have everything right. So first thing we need to do is re let's replace the shear flows. So we obtained negative shear flows, right? So this one was minus six, so I'm going to reverse. So this should be in this direction and this is going to be equal to six Newton per millimeter. Same thing for this Q1, we obtained minus 12, so I'm going to reverse this shear flow. So it needs to go this way. And this is 12 Newton per millimeter. Okay? And this Q0 also needs to be reversed. So it needs to go this way. And this is equal to 6 Newton per millimeter. All right? So this is the correct distribution of the shear flows. As you can see, in these walls, the shear flow is constant always, right? There is no linear distribution for shear flow, not quadratic. Everything is very simple in this idealized model. But there are some things we need to, to check to make sure this is correct. For example, the first thing we need to check is equilibrium equation on the horizontal direction. Summation of forces needs to be equal to zero, right? Look at this. Uh, the shear flow, this shear flow here at the top, this one, six Newton per millimeter. So six Newton per millimeter. I need to multiply this by the length of this wall if I want to get the force, right? So the length of this wall is 2,000 millimeters, right? And I need to do the same for this one because these two shear flows, they are, they have the, this horizontal orientation, right? So this one is going to be minus six times, again, the wall also has this 2,000 millimeters length, right? So these two, they cancel each other. At the end, we get this equal to zero. So the equilibrium in the uh, horizontal direction is validated, okay? Now, what about the vertical direction? So I need to have the force in this wall two, three in the vertical direction needs to be equal to the external applied load of 48 kilonewtons. So let's see if that, if that is the case. So I get, 12 Newton per millimeter is the shear flow. I need to multiply this by the, the, the height of this wall to three, which is 4,000 millimeters. Agree with me? So I need, if I multiply this by 4,000 millimeters, this needs to be equal to um, 48 kilonewton. Is this correct or not? So 12 times 4,000 is 48,000 newtons, which is equal to 48 kilonewton. It matches perfectly, right? Okay. Look, if If, let me just delete these dimensions here, I need some space here on the right hand side. If I decided to do the, the real, the real structure like this. Okay. Imagine I give you this real example, same 48 kilonewtons. Okay, for this. 
So you have, on the left hand side, you have the idealized structure we have been working on. On the right hand side, you have the real structure. So if I ask you to get the, the shear flow distribution on the real structure, cross section, you will get something like this at the end. We are not going to do that, that here, but you will get something like this. Shear flow starting from zero at point one, increasing linearly. Then it will continue on this wall, increasing in a quadratic way until it reaches the maximum value at neutral axis. Then it will start to decrease again. And then it will go from here to here. So you will get, if you try to do this example for the real cross section, you get the distribution of the shear flow like this, which is very, very, very different from, from this one. Uh, look, what, which one is the more accurate? Of course, is this one for real structure, right? It's much more accurate. Why? Because at any, any, any point of these sections, you have the real shear flow. So and you, you, you can see how it is changing on this wall. While in this idealized structure, the shear flow is always constant and equal to 6. So it, uh, the idealized structures, uh, they work in a kind of an, an average way, average sense while the real structure distribution of shear flow is the real shear flow you have. Where the, the For example, this value that you have here, the maximum shear flow at this point, is very different probably of 12 Newton per millimeters, okay? Um, Okay, uh, what else do I need to, to show you? Um, yeah, uh, okay, so another thing is, for example, for the calculation of the force, for the calculation of the force in this wall 2, 3, for the case of the idealized structure, we just uh, multiply this shear flow 12, right, 12 by the length of the wall. So we can do this because the shear flow in this wall is constant. In the wall 2, 3 is constant in the idealized cross-section. For the case of the real structure, so you will have here, for this, you will have a distribution of the shear flow, right? It's a quadratic equation, remember? In this local variable, remember we define these local variables S, right? You will have a distribution of shear flow. So if you want to have the total force in this wall on the real structure, what you have to do is you can say the total force in this wall needs to be the integral from 0 to S. In this case, S is going to be equal to 4,000, sorry, of the shear flow, right? So if you have here a quadratic function, you will need to integrate, get the primitives of quadratic terms on S. And then you will get the, the force. So this, that is a major difference, right? So if you want to get the forces, in the case of the real structure, you will have to do the integral, the primitives. For the idealized structure, you just need to multiply the shear flow by the length. Right? And why do you need the force? Well, you need the force, for example, to validate, to check everything is correct. But you also need the force to calculate the moment. Remember, in closed cross-sections, you need to calculate the moments, use the equilibrium of the moments. You need to get the force. So you can imagine how easy it's going to be to get the moments for the idealized cross-sections, right? And in fact, I can do one example before we finish of uh, just one more example, a quick one now for an idealized cross-section. For you to see how, how easy this is going to be. So imagine I give you this cross-section. Let's just do this more example and then we go, okay? Let's do this in a quick way. So you have here external transverse shear force, 100 kilonewton, in the, apply it at this boom A, this is boom A, this is boom B, C, and D. Now dimensions, from here to here, it is 800 millimeters. From here to here, in the vertical direction, it is 600 millimeters. 
and from here to here it is 300 and from this one to this one it is 150 right that is quite obvious i didn't need to put that but anyway sorry only millimeters yes what else do i think um, we must have the area of the booms yeah so for the area of the booms they give us ba equal to bd so the area of boom a is equal to the area of boom d equal to 900 millimeters square and the area of boom b equal to the area of boom c equal to 750 millimeters square okay so these two booms they have areas different from these two other booms okay so careful with that but this is neutral axis which this neutral axis here in red is an uh, axis of symmetry as well right divides this cross section into symmetric parts so it means we can still use this equation qr equal to qr minus one minus sy over ix br times y r this is the neutral axis this is the same this equation we are going to use and we can use this equation in this example because first from symmetry the products of inertia vanish they disappear second we don't have any sx transfer shear force in the horizontal direction that also simplifies a lot so this is similar with the previous example we did right now again same thing you need to assign an initial orientation for the shear flow so let's assign anti-clockwise so this can be for example q1 q2 in fact let me assign clockwise this time because it's easy to follow from there <laughs> sorry you don't need to copy right i upload this video you have been managing to see the videos in panopto yeah, yeah. yeah. q2 q3 and Q4. So the reason why I'm doing this way is because we don't need them to do the, the calculations because I have the results here if I use this orientation. Uh, now, you remember from two weeks ago that when we worked the closed cross sections, we said the, the, key, the key issue was the initial shear flow, right? Remember? Because we don't have any free edge, so when it is an open cross section like this one, we always start at a boom at the free edge because we know that the shear flow before crossing that boom is equal to zero, right? In the case of this cross closed cross section, we don't have any free edge. So it means we will need to assume that one of these four shear flows, Q1 or Q2 or Q3 or Q4, is known or is given to us. Okay, so let's say for example, let me see which one I, I choose it here. I choose it Q4. Assume that Q4 is given to you. So let's say Q4 given. All right. And then if Q4 is given, we need to start our analysis by crossing boom. Which boom do you think we need to cross first? A, B, C, or D? A. A, right? So if I'm assuming that we know Q4, or Q4 is given, we need to start crossing boom A. So that I can say, so crossing boom A. That I can say that the shear flow after crossing the boom is Q1. The shear flow before crossing the boom is Q4, which we are assuming that we know how much is this Q4 is given. Minus SY. SY is minus 100. So look at the signal now, minus, okay? Because the positive Y is upwards. This 100 kilonewtons is downwards, okay? So that's why you need to have there minus. Second moment of area, we need to calculate. So 
the second, let's do very quickly here. We have boom A and boom B, they have the same area. So two times the area of boom A, which is 900, times the distance of boom A to neutral axis, which is 300 square. And we need to add the contribution of boom B and boom C. They have equal area, so I can say two times the area which is 750 times the distance, the square of the distance which is 150 square. Okay? This gives the second moment <coughs> of area equal to 195.75 times 10 power 6 millimeters power 4. Alright? Okay, so this is the result we need to use here, 195.75 times 10 power 6. And now I need to multiply this by the area of boom A, which is 900. I need to delete this and its space. And I need to multiply now by the distance to neutral axis, y, r, which is this distance, right? From here to here, which is 300, right? Agree with me? Yeah? So I need to multiply by 300. If you do this, you get q4 plus 137.9, okay? So Q4, so everything is going to be a function of this Q4. So we know Q4, right? Sorry? We know Q4, this gets us. No, we will calculate Q4 at the end. So at this point, you are assuming that, okay, Q4 is known. Imagine is known. It is not really known. But in order to start the analysis, we need to choose because we, this is a close, closed cross-section with one cell, right? Uh -huh. So we need to select one. You remember two weeks ago, right? We have to select one, one shear flow as a given. If you have two cells, you need to select two shear flows, one of each cell as given. If you have three cells, you need to get three shear flows as given, and so on, all right? Now, next step, crossing boom B. If you cross boom B now, you get what? You get the shear flow after crossing boom B is Q2. The shear flow after, uh, before crossing is Q1, right? So this term is same. The area is different. The area of boom B is 750. And the distance to neutral axis is also different, which is now this distance, which is 150, right? But Q1, we calculated Q1 before we concluded it was, so Q1, it was Q0, sorry, Q4 plus 1, 37.9, we calculated before. Um, this term here is, if you do this math, is 57.47. So this results in Q4 plus 195.37 newtons per millimeter, okay? So again, Q2 is also a function of Q4. So I think we better start keeping these results here somewhere. So Q1, we concluded it was equal to Q4 plus 137.9. Now we have Q2 equal to Q4 plus 195.37. Okay.
and we can now continue our analysis by crossing boom C okay so you can you can do this at home but in the now here I am going to just use the symmetry of the cross section and from the symmetry we can say that Q3 needs to be equal to Q1 from symmetry of the cross section so it's going to be equal to Q4 plus 137.9 okay from symmetry but you can cross boom C at home and uh, you should get this result at the end um, Good, so we have everything now, but everything is function of this few Q4, isn't it? So how do we get uh, uh, this Q4? So if we calculate Q4, we unlock everything and the problem is solved. So that's what we are going to, to, to do now to get this Q4. And for that, I'm going to use this equation that we used it already. Summation of moments produced by the external transverse shear force about any point, for example, about boom number D, needs to be equal to the summation of moments produced by the internal shear flows about the same point. Okay? This is... Uh, so... The left-hand side of this uh, moment equation is very easy because this transverse shear force of 100 kilonewtons that you have here is passing on boom D, isn't it? So the moment is zero. So this left-hand side is zero. The right-hand side, for the calculation of the moments produced by the shear flows, you remember last week in torsion we said the shear flow from torsion, we can calculate the moments by using this expression, <coughs> two times the area times the shear flow, 2AQ. Remember this from torsion last week? Which area is this? Well, let's, let's do this analysis by starting with the shear flow crossing, uh, the shear flow Q1, they're starting with this shear flow Q1. What is the moment produced by this Q1 about boom D? So what, I, what you have to do, now this is very important. So you are calculating the, the moments about point D. So you need to, to use the boom at D. And you need to use two more booms to get this area. Is the, so this shear flow Q1 is between boom A and boom B. So these three booms that you have there in red, you are going to connect these three booms. So if you connect these three booms, the area, the area you are going to need to use is this area of this triangle. Okay? So you will always need to use three booms to define these triangles. Okay? I'm going there. You need to use these three booms to define these triangles. The first boom is always the boom where you are evaluating the moment. In this case, boom D. The other two booms that you need is the booms that are uh, sharing the same wall where you have the shear flow, in this case, Q1. So the booms sharing that wall are booms A and boom B. If you connect these three booms, you form this triangle. The area you need to use for this equation, 2AQ, this area is going to be the area of that triangle that you have there. Yes? Yeah. So this is only the contribution of Q1. Yeah? Is, is D just the point that you just take because of the uh, force yeah. going through it? Yeah, I, I, I decided to calculate the moments about point D. Yeah. You can use a different point if you want. This is perfectly fine, okay? So I'm going to undo all the, of these, otherwise the, this figure is going to be very heavy. So the contribution of shear flow Q1, I'm going to put here, is going to be two times the area of that triangle. So that triangle, it has 600 times 800 
which is the distance in the perpendicular direction. So this 800 is the distance in this perpendicular direction, right? So I need to multiply this by 800 and divide by 2. This is the area of that triangle, right? Agree? And I need to multiply, so I need to have 2AQ. I need to multiply this now by the shear flow in that wall, and that shear flow is Q1. Okay? Yeah? So this is the contribution of shear flow Q1 for the moment, about D. Now, we have the contribution of the shear flow Q2. Let's see, which booms do I need to use? Again, boom D, I'm going to make them green now. Boom D, and uh, the other two booms I need to use is the booms sharing the wall where Q2 is applied, so it needs to be boom B and boom C. If I connect these three booms, it, this is the triangle I need to use for the area. This is quite simple, right? It's like a, a riddle, right? Connect the booms, three booms. Now we just, we just need to calculate the area of this triangle. That area is going to be 300 times 800 over 2. Quite simple, right? So the contribution is 2 times the area of the triangle, which is 300 times 800 over 2, times the shear flow in that wall, which is going to be Q2. Okay? Look, shear flow Q3 and shear flow Q4, they both pass on this point D, so the moment produced about D is zero. The moment, the contribution to the moment from Q3 and Q4 about point D is going to be zero. You all agree with me? So that's it. That's all we have in these equations. So we can, what, what can we do now? So we have this equation, zero on the left-hand side. Uh, these two cancel with these two. These two cancel with these two. We can simplify a bit. Uh, what else? Well, we have, uh, okay, so we will have here 600 times 800. Now Q1, Q1 is Q4 plus 137.9. Next is 137 It's here, right? Here. I'm just replacing, and I need to add the contribution of Q2, so 300 times 800 times Q2, and Q2 is Q4 plus 195.37. That's it. So the only unknown in this equation is Q4, isn't it? If you look at this expression, the only unknown that you have is Q4, which if you calculate, you get Q4 equal to, according to my results here, minus 157.05 Newton per millimeter. That's what we obtain from this equation. Now, if you replace Q4 in these expressions here, you unlock Q1, Q2, and Q3. So you get you get Q1 equal to minus 19.15 Newton per millimeter and Q2 equal to 38.32 Newton per millimeter. Okay? All right? Now, I leave it to you now, at home, to replace the shear flows here, Q4, Q1, Q2, and update the orientation of the shear flows based on the signal you got at the end. And I leave it to you to confirm summation of forces in the vertical direction needs to be equal to 100 kilonewton. You can do that at home to practice a bit but for today I think we've had enough what do you think? so next week we do multiple cells right? <laughs>